we've got our three speakers, which is the most important thing. So um, welcome everyone. Um, it's Hi, it's good, good to see everybody. I think we've got a great um, program lined up here tonight. Should be should be really good. So um, thanks for coming. And tonight is members' night. And Zuckerberg Initiative working to. <laughs> So if everyone can put their microphone on mute, particularly if they have some household noise going on, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, so we've, we've got, it's members night. So we have three of our members presenting and um, I wanna thank them for um, being willing to step up and do that. That's fantastic. It's always a little nerve wracking, but we really appreciate it. So we've got Randy Rosenfield and Joe Whittington and Kurt Pradell are our speakers for tonight. Um, we've also got um, a great photo challenge slideshow to show. Um, the, the theme for this month was, wow, that's abstract, man. And uh, it must have struck a chord because we've got, I had 84 images submitted, which I think is a record, at least a record since I've been putting these slideshows together. So uh, it's a really good set of images. And I, I was thinking, what a shame we couldn't just print out all 84 and have those up on a wall somewhere uh, to look at a little gallery show would make a great, a great presentation. So we'll be uh, looking at that in just a moment. And um, if you are a, uh, joining us for the first time tonight, we just want to welcome you and uh, um, we're glad that you found us and we encourage you to go to portlandphotographersforum.com and learn a little bit more about us. We, we always have um, a few things going on and so that's a good place to start, but we're glad that you're here. And um, just wanted to welcome the most recent members, some folks who've joined since August 1st, um, Jenna Kalk, Scott Kyle, uh, Michael Crawl, and James Cushman. Um, we're, we wanna welcome you and we're glad you're with us. I know a couple of you, I think uh, Scott and James attended um, Mark Fitzgerald's uh, uh, workshop on color. So, we sort of got to at least hear your voices a few times, if not uh, uh, see you. So welcome to the forum. Um, a few quick announcements I just wanted to go over. Uh, I mentioned Mark Fitzgerald's uh, class on color, which wrapped up this Saturday, which was excellent. And we had a, a good group attend that workshop. And there's another opportunity uh, for a workshop with Mark that happens on October 30th. So you've got plenty of time to think about it and sign up. But I wanted to let folks know about that. I think it's gonna be really interesting. It's on black and white. And Mark's gonna cover a wide uh, variety of topics, um, you know, from the basics of why do people uh, do black and white photography, sort of the psychology of, of black and white photography, the differences between color contrast and, and uh, tonal contrast. Um, and he'll go into a little bit about uh, working with black and white in, in Lightroom and uh, Photoshop and how to, uh, how to get the most out of your black and white prints. So if you're interested in black and white photography and you wanna sort of polish up on, on what it's all about and, and how to make your images um, look the way you want them to, I encourage you to sign up for that class. And that's just a one day class, one Saturday, October 30th. Um, and the sign up is on the workshops tab on the webpage. Um, Blue Sky Gallery is going strong with, with images by Pat Rose and Kurt Pradell um, now in the drawer. And um, wanted to mention that we're trying to put the schedule ahead or uh, plan ahead for the blue sky drawer into 2022. And so if that's something you've been thinking about, if you've got some images that you'd love to get out there and, and show at the blue sky gallery, um, uh, let us know. And, and the contact for that is uh, Andrew Greenhill and you can get his email address uh, from his, uh, off of the members page. Um, look for Andrew on the members page of the website. 
grab his email and uh, let him know if you're interested because um, we're trying to get the first few months of uh, next year um, filled for the blue sky drawer. Um, I wanted to mention real quickly, we've got, um, let's see here. Right now there's a, there's a, um, the artists who are on our, um, our exhibition page on the website are Carol Isaac, Pat Rose, Kathleen Grady, and Ray Bittigan. And I know that those images are about to um, change again for October. So if you haven't had a chance to go on the website and look at their images, there's some um, really wonderful images there to uh, take a look at. Um, and then finally, wanted to mention there's another Sunday school outing in the works for this coming um, Sunday, September 26th, I think it is. And um, it's gonna be in the St. John's neighborhood of Portland. Um, folks are gonna meet at 8 a.m. in front of the uh, uh, Blue Moon um, camera store and just uh, do one of, the, one of our sort of self-directed workshops where we get together and, and uh, make images and talk about making images or whatever people wanna do. So that's a lot of fun. And you don't have to sign up for that if you're interested in coming. Um, just show up and I will, I will put out a little reminder uh, in the email to everybody about that as well. Uh, so Gary, thanks for setting that up. Um, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So I think that's about it for announcements, unless any of the board members need to remind me of something I might have forgotten. Okay, good. Well, I am going to go ahead and set up our um, monthly challenge slideshow here and show that. So give me just a moment and I will get that going. Can everybody see that?
Well, thank you all so much. Um, this group obviously likes abstracts and is very good at them. So that was a lot of fun to uh, see all those images come in and put that together. So next, we're going to move right into our featured speakers for the night. And um, first up is Randy Rosenfield. And Randy, are you set to go? Hold on a sec. All right. Yes. Can everybody see that? Yes. Oh, good. That's um, so I'm doing um, a PowerPoint presentation. And um, what I'm doing is sharing with you a project that I've been working on where I'm combining abstraction uh, with architectural photography and cityscape photography. And my goal is to create an experience where you can see and feel cities in a new way by virtue of the fact that I'm transforming things that are known and repeatable to things that are unknown and unrepeatable. So I said mystery and challenge. And so what's the challenge? The challenge is if you think about it, cities are all about um, buildings and streets that are designed to prevent or at best control chaos, ideally. And, you know, we do this through blueprints and glass and reinforced concrete and my dog chewing on a bottle at the appropriate time. Um, so we do this by reinforcing our buildings, hopefully so that they'll last hundreds of years. And my question is what happens when I upend all the structure and in fact create chaos? And can I do that in a way that you, the viewer, wants to take in and is intrigued by my photographs? So that's the challenge. So now let me talk about the mystery. When I was recently in the Art Institute of Chicago, I saw um, a quote from a modernist painter there, Arthur Dove. And what he said is, there's no such thing as um, abstraction. In fact, it's extraction. It's gravitation to a certain direction and minding your own business. And if the extraction be clear enough, the value will exist. And when I read that, I thought, wow, I can really relate to this because there's a definite mystery for me when I take my multiple exposures because I never know exactly what'll happen. And that's the fun and the curiosity of it because each of my photographs is unpredictable, unique, and I can't recreate them. So there's four types of mysteries that I've been exploring that I wanna share with you tonight. One is the hidden design and abstract shapes in the buildings. The second is the ability to see a cityscape from a new perspective. The third is to have an experience of feeling the city. And then the fourth is to see the playfulness and the whimsy that's hidden inside of uh, cities. So let me first share with you about the hidden design. So again, same place, the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I saw a quote that Charles Green Shaw, again, another American modernist painter, believed that a work of art doesn't require a subject in order to evoke an aesthetic response. And the way I interpreted it for myself is that a work of art doesn't require an identifiable subject in order to evoke an aesthetic response. So now that I've kind of set the stage for what I'm gonna show you, I won't be saying a whole lot. I'll basically let my photographs speak for themselves, but certainly if anybody wants to speak up at any time, uh, feel free. So 
this starts off with some of the photos where the buildings and their purpose are obscured, but they still retain the power and the boldness of the architecture. And if I'm going too fast or too slow, just let me know. Randy, if you could slow it just a little bit, I'm still, okay. I'm, I'm enjoying taking in the detail of these. Give us just a couple more seconds per picture. Okay, thank you. So as you can see with this one and some of the others, um, you can see on the one hand, the design, but also as you look closer, you can see the whisper of the buildings that were the, at the genesis of the photograph. So I don't know if anybody needs me to go back to anyone or just keep going. Okay, I'll keep going. So I wanted to see what would happen in black and white. And also if I use, you know, what would happen if I tried it with older buildings that had a different set of curves and, and uh, design to them. Randy, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> maybe just briefly mention as you go along um, how many images you chose to make of each different one. I'm noticing different numbers of pictures and, and what goes into your mind as to, oh, I think I'll do four of this or seven of that. So as you're implying, Mike, um, it is multiple exposures inside of my camera. And um, I would say that if I'm stacking some of the photographs, either vertically or horizontally, I tend to do more and it might be four to six. And um, if I'm rotating the camera, it might be three or four. One of the things I'm thinking about is how many distractions there are. So for example, I took some photographs in the um, United Terminal at the Chicago Art Museum and I thought it was gonna be great, but what happened was there was so much light coming from all the different panes of glass, it just became confusion. So I don't have a formula that I go by um, and some of it is trial and error. And here's one where I said, okay, well suppose it's just a plain old ordinary building and a plain old ordinary staircase, what could I do with that? So Randy, how many exposures are in this piece? It just becomes just total abstraction. Although I can make out a staircase for sure, but uh, it looks like it's almost, uh, you know, kind of the Zeb Andrews style where he just sort of puts all sorts of, uh, um, frames uh, stacked on each other, but I know it's not that. So what's going on here? Um, you know, guys, I really wish I was the kind of person that took notes after each photograph, <laughs> but I'm not. 
<laughs> so I don't know. I am suspecting that it was about three. Yeah, it looks like. But three. I'm not really sure. Yeah, and this is indoors, I assume. No, this is out, oh, I'm outdoors. Like fire escape or out something? Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm going to take the privilege of the fact that Jim and I are on the same Zoom call and ask Jim if he could come downstairs and find out what my dog is doing right now. It sounds like he's uh, like tearing the carpet apart. <laughs> and this is a photograph uh, from inside the Chicago Art Museum looking out. He's over there too. <laughs> so now let's take a look at cityscapes and what I'm trying to do here is to take something familiar you know a view of a city maybe ones that we all know or maybe not because I have photographed in uh, Chicago New York Philadelphia um, Portland and uh, New Orleans although the New Orleans ones aren't here, but anyway. Um, so take photographs of things that you can identify, shake it up and to create from something familiar, something that's unfamiliar, to take something that's realistic and make it unrealistic, but almost believable. And so that's what I've done here. So Randy, these are all in camera? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you go out, do you have like a, you know, you kind of talked about this a little bit, but do you have a strategy? Like you had that arch on the preceding uh, photograph. I mean, you, you saw that and like, what would, I'm curious what your thought process is there as you're, as you're clicking the shutter. I hate to be disappointing, but I don't have it planned out. I've, I've kind of developed a, what Jim calls an intuitive sense um, where I'm starting to just get a sense of what would work and what wouldn't work. This happens to be the Fremont Bridge. And so uh, some of it is, you know, what's true for you when you all take your photos, what catches your eye? What, intrigues you. And so I go there and then start playing with uh, messing it up. <laughs> so this is a stack, a vertically stacked multiple exposure. And there's a couple of things that intrigue me about this one. Uh, one is it almost looks like I was saying before, kind of almost realistic, even though you know it isn't. So it, it almost looks at the bottom. Let me see if I can put my mouse there. Yeah. The, mod the bottom as if there's some kind of city floating on a lake with reflections of trees that we can't see anywhere else in the photo. But they kind of look like they must be reflections of trees. So it's to me, intriguing about what you can find in the photographs. And if you were able to see them you know, closer up, you could actually, again, this is Portland, identify some of the specific buildings in the photograph. Like this one is says East Bank and it's uh, along I-84, you would see it. Um, and the, the funny thing about this is that Jim and I were um, eating at Portland City Grill a few, about a month ago after we had both seen these photographs several different times. And as we were looking out the window at Portland, Portland looked so small and tiny compared to what had become real through these photographs. You know, this one is so intriguing, uh, Randy. It, it's almost like uh layers of civilization. It's almost like an archeological 
dig, we're at the bottom. Uh, it looks like some almost ancient civilization uh, on the lower levels there, and then quite modern the farther up you go. It's almost like third world in the middle, <laughs> first world on top, and then very ancient at the bottom. So very nicely done. Thank you. And Randy, what? how large do you like looking at your images? I mean, like very large, like four by six feet, or intimate, you know, like five by seven? Oh, that's an interesting question, Janice, because I haven't had any of them printed up yet. And my hope is that there's enough sharpness when they're printed large. You know, not all of them need to be printed large, you know, like some of the ones of the design, you know, don't have to be huge. I would like it big enough so people can really see both the design, which is obvious, and then start to say, oh, there's windows, there's a door, there's a balcony, and so forth. Um, something like this, on the other hand, I think would be really cool if it could be really large, just so you could dig in and see all the different things that are there. You know, the cars on the bridges, and oh, here's a building I recognize, and here's a highway sign, and so forth, all that's hidden in here. And Randy, do you find that you manipulated the colors at all when you were um, satisfied with the composition when you were doing your post-processing? Sometimes I did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's funny when they're on the back of the camera and you know the screen's about this big. Right. You know, the, there's sharper contrast and the black point is more intense mm -hmm. than when it comes out in Lightroom. Right. So. I'm trying to replicate kind of what I see on the back of the camera. And so sometimes I do um, goose up the colors and sometimes the colors for some reason turn out to be too monochromatic, in which case I try them in black and white. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So this is uh, one of a couple ones that I did where I said, okay, well, I've been doing the bigger cityscapes. What happens if I zoom in? to a closer in shot. Randy, can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. When you do multiple exposures, how do you identify and keep still so that there is a particular um, axis that doesn't quaver? I don't. So I'm, I'm not using a tripod. Uh -huh. So you take this picture and you see that the buildings all emanate from one point, an X, like an X axis. Uh, you, so you sort of twirl it on your tripod. I don't use a tripod. I'm just doing it by hand. But maybe the fact that I'm doing them in fairly fast sequence, that might help. Oh, I think that's amazing. <laughs> And are you spending time with each of your subjects, each of your the scenes before you, to decide whether um, you know a horizontal multiple exposure or a vertical or a you know an axis point in the middle, and then your twisting would be a, to best effect? Are you trying them all with each subject, or how how is your workflow going out in the field? So again, it's uh, more intuitive. I just have a sense that uh, some of them you know, uh, doing it vertically or horizontally might not be that interesting. And so I try the other or conversely, uh, you know, more rotating it might be kind of meaningless. You know, that's the great thing about uh, 
DSLRs you can delete. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so here's another one um, trying to be more close in at a location. And um, I also am trying to play around with having people in the photograph so I can juxtapose, you know, the reality of the world or the city and the bizarreness that I'm trying to create at the same time. Sorry, Randy, going back to the people, I remember you and I were out together shooting and we were, I think it might've been intentional camera movement that we were working with trying to get the people to show up somehow, but uh, your people aren't uh, being, uh, you know, kind of dissected here. <laughs> they're, I mean, they're not part of like Chicago Place is being, uh, you know, a victim of multiple exposure, but your people aren't. So are they, they're just shooting, right. going through the scene on one of the frames, presumably. Is that right? Yes, that's, that's right. Okay. And I have a lot of, I've been having a lot of trouble with capturing people mm -hmm. because a lot of times what happens with, I don't know, somehow the multiple exposures kind of erases parts of them. Right. And it's icky. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys can see uh, the people in the center there. Yes. Could you, could you go back to that one? That's really different than the others. If you're wondering if the methodology is different, it's not. I, I might have taken more um, multiple exposures in it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. If, I'm just saying the color palette on this is amazing and the, oh. the kind of circular. Uh, I really love this one and I have to say it's it's pretty unique. Um, it's really it doesn't look like architectural photography, but it just has a kind of a, a look of its own. Uh, but this one is just lovely. I just have to say that. Oh, thank you. Do you guys think it makes any difference if you know where the, you recognize the place or you don't? Not for me. I think it's, uh, I mean, it's interesting when I recognize a place, but mostly I'm not finding myself trying to do that. If, if you were to try to do a series, maybe of Chicago, maybe that would be more enjoyable to the viewer, but I don't, I don't think it matters. Yeah, to me, this borders on fantasy, so the, the place is almost a dream for me when I look at these. Thanks for the feedback. Talk about fantasy. <laughs> I love the color palette on this one. This is beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Did you, did you, um, is this kind of like out of the camera color or is this something that you kind of uh, worked with? No, it is out of the color, out of the camera. You know, I tried, for example, to make sure that the building on the left, you know, that has a little bit of magenta in it, you know, that that showed up, but no, that's um, out of the camera. And uh, I find that a lot of them are blue you know, especially, you know, you saw in the beginning and Jim and I talked about that and, you know, it probably has to do with the, um, you know, light reflecting off of the windows. 
Andy, I think I think the movement in that last one that you just had up is really wonderful. Um, and, you know, it's curious or, or it's interesting to me, um, you, you, you know, you talk about this sort of an intuitive process, but um, you couldn't have pre-visualized that one better. It's just got a wonderful motion to it. Thanks. Randy, this reminds me like two, two artists. One is Picasso in his blue period. And the <laughs> second is there's a painter Deschamps and he did a, a nude or a female or a woman uh, descending a staircase. And it was like uh, one of the first kind of stop motion paintings, you know, around. And this so much reminds me of that. It's just gorgeous. Well, thanks, Janice. Um, I think I'm gonna reword my, uh, my project as Rosenfield in her blue period. <laughs> Yeah, I, I want to agree that, uh, and like the other one, I think um, I'm just more attracted to the ones with these kind of really beautiful color palettes. Um, it just kind of lends a kind of coherence to the thing. Um, uh, so, and I kind of agree with what they said, just, just emotion, uh, but just beautiful work and, you know, paying attention to the color, I think, because these can get very complicated and and almost, you know, chaotic. And maybe that's what you want too. But I mean, I, I really love this one and the other one because just su such great Greek colors. Thank you. Doug, how am I doing on time? Um, probably you should shoot for about 10 more minutes, roughly. Okay. So here I wanted to see, well, what happens if I try it at night? And I'm sorry, Randy, what are we looking at at the bottom? Those look like a million people holding <laughs> iPhones with their lights. I know, that, on. that's the beauty of it, is to try and imagine what's going on here. Yeah. Um, in actuality, it was just strings of lights. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was at the Navy Pier. Again, this one happens oh, to be in Chicago. Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked from where I was standing, I looked down and there were all these lights string, strung down there. Um, I think maybe there might've been a restaurant mm -hmm. kind of nearby. I thought, oh my goodness, this is too good to pass up. What can I do with it? <laughs> yeah. And then just doing the five or six or however many exposures you did just sort of multiplies that effect. Yeah. So, um, I was, you know, back to, I, I don't, couldn't see who was speaking, but uh, back to the point about color, you know, I also asked myself, well, what does it look like if I take away the color? And I happen to like this one because um, of the texture, especially. This one, Randy, and that one, the, the one that uh, gave you the title of Blue Period, it has a simplicity to it, a poetic simplicity to it of motion. And some of the others are kind of a little jangly. And uh, this one is just, it's just poetic. Thank you, Yanis. So this is not the same as the one you saw the same street, it's a little bit different. Looks very Escher-like to me. And Randy, do you give these titles? Like for example, this one? I'm not creative enough, to be honest. <laughs> but um, at some point, you know, after the presentation, so I can leave room for everybody else. Um, I'd love suggestions. <laughs> this one, when I saw it, it's like destruction. <laughs> 
Yeah, this one is evocative of the World Trade Center uh, after 9-11. Very yeah. much. Can, it's yeah, funny that you said that because somebody else said that, and this is a picture in New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. So now let's switch to how we all might experience cities from time to time, especially you know when we're walking around a new city, some of the feelings that we may feel sometimes overwhelmed, sometimes uh, hectic, sometimes intrigued, sometimes foreboding, chaotic. You know, so you can only imagine what this guy might be feeling. <laughs> and then up in the top there, you can see kind of a more realistic view of the city outside. That has the wow factor. Thank you. I really am trying to figure out which ones stand out to people. So I appreciate everybody's comments very much. That was a question I had for you, Randy, is uh -huh. like, what's your success rate where you go and look at an image and go, wow? Um, I've been pretty happy with the number of ones that I've come up with that I've liked. I mean, I could show you guys a whole other set too that I like just as much. And um, I think it was Rita. Um, I've also put together ones that were just Portland and could put together ones that were just Chicago where I was recently. So I've been, I've been happy with it. Again, if these are uncomfortable, that's kind of the point of these, this series. <laughs> this one I think of is Night on Bald Mountain. <laughs> And again, flipping to black and white, what does that do for the experience? And here, yeah, I mean, to me, this is like foreboding, like with a capital F. And uh, I like the, over here, you know, the juxtaposition of something that's actually kind of realistic to this chaotic stuff in the rest of the photo in the dark clouds. Yeah, it's like a tornado carrying away that that little house. Yeah. I think the crop shape adds to that sense. Oh. Yeah, that's a good uh, point, Johanna. So uh, Randy, how, how much cropping do you do with these? That can vary, Pat. Sometimes um, the photo as it is, I take it. And other times, you know, it's funny, I can find just uh, uh, something that's very small part of the photo and enlarge it, and it, it that's it's like perfect that way mm -hmm. so it's, it's really unpredictable and interesting <laughs> so randy you put these in the feeling category as opposed mm -hmm. to and i forgot what you called the previous category what made the cityscapes what made you put these in the feeling category you know I've thought about that, Giannis, that um, 
some of these could go in multiple different categories. This one is another one um, of trying to juxtapose a person who's very realistic, you know, the woman with her baby in the suitcase, and then the chaotic nature of the surrounding. And so I looked at it and felt like, wow, here's this woman just thinking she's going into the airport, you know, like normal day, and she has no idea what's confronting her. Jim had a different take on it, which I thought was interesting too. And that was maybe this is sometime in the future. And, uh, you know, here's a woman who's entering chaos. She knows it and she's completely comfortable with that. And maybe we have something to learn from her. So Randy, I hate to do this, but I'm gonna, you're down to a couple minutes. Okay, thanks Doug. Randy, so, I just want to say in your earlier color work, um, Georgia, have you seen Georgia O'Keeffe's? She did some paintings of New York skyscrapers. I don't know if you've seen that, but boy, it's your some of your some of yours are really reminiscent of that, and you might just want to take a look because um, she is such a you know master of color among other things. Um, but um, just really wonderful work, and thank you. Thank you. So I'll go quickly through this last uh, category, and this is just the playfulness of the city. I should uh, mention, uh, I don't want to embarrass you, Randy, but this one was posted on the Instagram page uh, the other day and it got a record number of uh, likes from our followers. So that was, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of good kudos, kudos for this picture. I think everybody liked this style. It was just so unique, interesting. Thank you. I put this one in here um, because it wasn't until I actually printed it out that I saw that this purple thing down here, there's a performance, a performer and a whole performance and a bunch of people watching it that I had no idea about. <laughs> I photo in black and white and most of my playful whimsy ones are in color, but I liked this one. And here's the last one. So I don't know if you guys have any other feedback for me. Um, and if we don't have time, if you could uh, send it to me, I'd appreciate it really very much. And thanks. Thanks, Randy. Uh, really, really interesting, nice work. Well done. Yeah, wonderful, Randy. I just, I'm just blown away by these images and your talent in doing these multiple exposure shots is just phenomenal. You need a show. This need the, we need to see these uh, uh, as prints on a wall in a big room. Yeah, large prints would be wonderful. And I think keep at it. You've got a book here for sure. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Thanks again, Randy. Um, and so next up, We've got um, Joe Whittington. Joe, are you Oops, wait a second. ready to go? So I'll do the share screen here. There we go.
Is that visible? Yep, we see your uh, your Lightroom uh, panel. There we go. Okay, so <clears throat> kind of background for uh, my photography experience after spending three years looking at uh, satellite photographs uh, for the CIA. Um, I went back to uh, Thailand for my third Vietnam tour and um, bought a camera, first uh, single lens reflex camera that I'd use. And we were up on the Mekong River up in the northeast corner there. Then I was flying in and out of Vietnam. Um, but they turned out to have photography courses there. And so we learned how to, um, and of course, working with black and white film. And um, so primarily with black and white initially, I was just looking for going out, wandering around uh, Nakam Phanam and uh, looking for things that were more geometric and patterns and this sort of thing. And, um, and I have like 10 prints that I, uh, I took the photos and developed the film and made the prints. And I still have them from 1974. Slow down a little bit, please. Okay. So again, just looking for, you know, forms and contrasts and, and things. And um, my wife accused me of never having people in my photos, but, and, but I tend to be drawn to people when there are people around. Um, so, Joe, are these are these um, scans of prints that yes. you did back in the day? Yeah, these are prints made in 1974, and I had this have them in a folder, and they're they're about the only ones I have actually. Okay, that's what was left over. So. Um, of course, the class was primarily focused on black and white because we were doing that. That's the film we had the capability to develop. Um, but I, I pretty quickly switched over to slides. And um, I don't know why this, the, the color and the actual, um, you know, realism is what more appeals to me, I really, than, than necessarily the black and white, although that's kind of cool. Um, <clears throat> But I, but I just appreciate it. So this is the, for the, probably most of you haven't been there. This is the Mekong River that is Laos. Um, and um, so this is the, the Thai version of the Dag dragon boat races. <laughs> and uh, so 70, 73, 74 is my last Vietnam tour. We were, we were out, there was still, still activity. And um, I'm probably sitting in a bar on the river there and um, uh, there's nothing going on now, but occasionally you'd have airstrikes going in over the Kars Hills there and uh, secondaries and other things. So it's an interesting time. Looks like a PBR. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is mostly, this is in Bangkok because I was going back and forth to Bangkok and, uh, and uh, as well as Vietnam. And this is just mostly showing you that I really wasn't, I always haven't been old, so. Um. <laughs> So um, Bangkok in, in 73, 74 was just an amazing place to go. Um, hardly any people there, and uh, which is much different from today if you, anyone's been there recently. Is, your, is the slide film uh, ectochrome or what were you using? Uh, some of it's ectochrome. I think I probably gravitated more to Kodachrome. You know, this, this, the, the concept of working with a 25 ASA now, this would, was, seems amazing to me, but it, it seems to, you know, he's turned out pretty well. Um, and again, I've, I've, um, I've always enjoyed taking pictures of people and almost everywhere I've been, you know, you just smile, hold up the camera and most people are really seem to be kind of delighted to have their picture taken. This, this one is just really amazing. Look at all the different reactions that you're getting. Yeah, your yeah not, not everyone is happy, <laughs> but most of them are. <laughs> but, and that's usually the case, but yeah. So um, I was flying in and out of, uh, um, of Vietnam. We could only stay for a week at a time uh, because of the, whatever the truce rules were at the time. So, but the traffic there was, was just absolutely amazing. 
Um, and there was like a million of these little Renault Dauphine taxis around. Um, and for, for all you Vietnam veterans, this, is, uh, this should be very nostalgic because this is, this is the, uh, one of the primary Buffy stores in town. So that stands for Big Ugly Funny Elephant. So after, <clears throat> after I, I left uh, that tour, I, I taught at an intelligence training center in San Diego, developed a uh, handheld photography class and taught that. And, um, and then came back, left active duty, came back to Portland and started climbing. Uh, besides working at Tektronix, this was my first climb of Mount Hood in 1978. Um, and here's this, some shots. This is Yosemite, uh, Nepal, Denali, Kilimanjaro. And uh, so when I, then I retired from Tektronix and started a guide service. And so we went to Africa, did safaris, did Kilimanjaro climbs, um, and did, did trips all over the world as well as climbing in the local area. So um, like probably all of us, I have thousands of images um, and how to organize those was somewhat of a, a conundrum like I talked to somebody, I have, you know, I have 20,000 pictures. You want me to choose three to enter? Are you kidding? <laughs> so, um, so I, what I've kind of settled on is doing themes and I'm trying to, I work through these and this things that, you know, when I was out traveling wherever this compositions scenes that caught my eye. And so this is, this has the rather uninspiring title of alleys and passageways but this is kind of a theme. So I'll just uh, walk through them and um, kind of give you an idea. Of, this is uh, Manchu Picchu, if you've ever been there. Mm -hmm. I've actually climbed up that wine of Picchu. Hole. I actually have climbed up that to the top of that little peak there. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to go back and have free reign for just for two or three days there, but that's, uh, I'm not sure that's allowed or not, but. It may not be anymore. Yeah. So this is uh, Sian Reap area uh, in Cambodia. Of course, Angkor Wat's the most well-known, but there's hundreds of temples there. So I'd be hard pressed to tell you which one is which, but these are just some of the, the longer perspective. Um, I think the best trek that I ever did was in an area called Mustang, and it's uh, north central Nepal, and it was an independent kingdom until about 1992, and then became part of, uh, uh, of Nepal, but it was, so it's kind of like Tibet without the Chinese, so it's really in a very, very delightful area, and it's just, it's just, a, just an amazing place, so a lot of these buildings were some of the some of the period is from like 1400s is when some of these cities were built. Joe, what year were you there? Uh, I think most of these these were well. I did trips to China and, and Tibet trekking and and uh, trips there. So I think these are either probably 2011, 2013, 2014 around that area. Hey Joe, I'm wondering if you can close that little green box that superimposed oh, on the picture. Okay. Um, it's just kind of, let's, let me move it over to a different, there we go. No, oh, we didn't want to do that. Sorry. There we go. Okay. There you are. That looks great. Lonely calf. Uh, this is still in um, 
Mustang. This is the uh, the capital city. It's a walled city called Lo Mon Pong. Um, of course, they this they store wood and not there isn't much wood. Wood is a very scarce commodity there. But and they they do this washes basically they just stand on top of these places and pour the buckets of paint down and that's how they do the striped uh, contrast there. So Joe, when you're taking these photographs, like are uh, are you like documenting? Are you uh, uh, like what's going through your head as you're clicking the shutter? The, the, the issue, the, the <laughs> most of mine, what's going through my head, um, probably 90% of the time is where the hell are all my clients? <laughs> and so I'm, I'm carrying the camera with me and essentially I'm, I'm composing on the go. And, and when something clicks, I'm, I have the camera at the ready. I always, you know, this habit set up. And as I'm bringing it up, I'm thinking about, okay, what, what do we need to do to make, make the composition here? What do we need to do to get a good image? Um, and then taking the picture. So uh, it, for me, a real luxury would, have, would most of the time is just not having any clients, not having any responsibilities and just wandering around and taking, taking the photos. So. I'm enjoying retirement, certainly, but most of the time these were all, you know, interspersed with other activities. This is coming into Chame after a long, long day of trekking. This is the, the longest Manny wall in, uh, in Nepal. And of course, this was all the bottom of the Tetra Sea. So all of this is deposits that were deposited, you know, for millions of years. Uh, but it's, so it's just really, very, very colorful. But I, I could really, I really like this. And Manny wall is from Om Mani Padiham, which is the flower is the jewel is the flower of the lotus, which is what the, the Buddhists will chant and is written on all of the prayer wheels and prayer flags and things. I love all the blue points in that one. Pardon? I love all the blue points. In yeah. That. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, the colors is, is just is really fantastic there. So if you want to go on a cool track, that's uh, that's the place. So change of uh, territory. This is uh, Mary, Queen of Scots Church in Scotland. Uh, Mont St. Michael, Michel in France. This is Grenerve, uh, Monet's Garden. Giverny. thank you. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't been there, it's, it is just absolutely gorgeous. So, and Montmartre Church in the background there in Paris. In a small town and some small towns in France. This is a Fort Citadel in Ciceron down in um, Provence. And these are some passageways in the lower, lower level of the fort. So Joe, are you leading another tour here or is this- I've, like I've retired. Uh, no, actually we have, um, we have friends in France and uh, so this was just kind of this uh, wandering around with my friend uh, as we were going through the fort. So yeah, it wasn't, didn't have to keep track of anybody except me.
So I just kind of like the alleys and the passageways for the for this perspective and this uh, wondering what's around the corner. And so it's just. Okay. This is the um, Rodin Museum and uh, a lot of the sculptures they have outside and we just had this perspective with the, with the Eiffel Tower through these uh, Rodin figures. Not exactly a alleyway, but I thought it was cool. Um, most of you should know where this is. So. I can, I, I'm going to do a whole series. They have more variety of smokestacks in Venice, I think, than any place I've ever been. I became very fascinated with them. What year is this? Uh, I, I was climbing up in the Dolomites, so uh, this is maybe four years ago, four or five years ago. So I flew into, flew into Venice initially and spent uh, two or three days there on either end of the uh, climbing and, and Tuscany area. Uh, this is uh, Braga. It's a tiny little town up in the, up in the Dolmenites. So we uh, went in there and, and um, so before we, we were going, we climbed Two or three peaks the next day, but um, had an opportunity to wander around most of the afternoon. It was very, very interesting little hilltop town. It was almost exhausting against the climbs. And this was a, a nighttime handheld shot. And I just kind of like the way it, kind of the motion of the bike riders going down, but just very active, lots of people out drinking and eating and things and these kids riding their bikes. And then once we finished climbing, we were up in the Tuscany area, visiting, uh, Colibier winery. So I had a, basically had a private tour and wandered around. But I just love their uh, their archive area as it was. And we were just driving by, and I said, "Stop!" <laughs> Jumped out of the car, took this. Um, so this is this is the the image prior to any processing, other than taking the gate out. Uh, and this is kind of what I ended up with. I'm not sure which one I like the best, but I just love the perspective of the, the trees with the little hut at the end there. And I don't know, about three years ago, my wife and I went to Bali. So this is one of the, the Hindu temples there. water garden in Bali. And um, 2019, I think I went to Egypt and Jordan. And this is at uh, uh, Memphis, which is where some of the first pyramids were developed. So we, we had this, you had to crouch. This was about a four foot high passageway and then it opened up into this area here and then another big room inside. Lots of the hieroglyphics. Luxor. And this is my last one, but this is the Karash um, fort in Jordan, which was uh, built by the Crusaders and then took, taken over by the, uh, the, the Muslims when they moved back in. 
but that's it. So that was kind of the, the alleys and passageways and uh, any questions on anything? Great. You know, Joe, I, I think I'd like to have actually heard just a little bit more, like for example, this photograph and, and actually in that Mustang area is like a Dutch doctor and I, uh, we went there in 1976 and we were one of the first quote official people to be able to be allowed. Oh yeah, that would, that would have been very early. Yeah. yeah, you know, so I'd like to hear more about like, you know, like uh, you kind of ran through these photographs really fast, but there's a lot of history and a lot of information uh, oh, yeah. that you visually have shown. And I'd sure like to have heard more about like what each one of these photographs are like or about. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, you know, it's kind of like, uh, for sure. Um, and you can, I guess, you know, focus on, on one area and more specifically, for sure. Hey, hey Joe, uh, uh, your first ones, uh, Vietnam, I mean, they, they were beautiful, uh, very photojournalistic. And you, I could see you shot with film. Um, I really like the, the, the color on, on the one with the dragon boats. Um, but I'm just wondering, you seem like you like to travel a lot. Have you thought of going back there and seeing what it's like, like almost 50 years later since the end of the uh, war? I haven't been back to Vietnam. I did, I did go back. I was never, never in country in Cambodia. Um, I mean, every time we flew over Cambodia, they shot at us a lot. Um, so it's much nicer now. Um, but I had never been on, on the, uh, on the ground during the, during any of my three Vietnam tours. Um, so, um, I don't know. I, 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 I run so many trips to Asia that, um, I think I'm probably mostly going back to Europe now. Uh, Joe, I, um, quick question about your, uh, later images, your early images, uh, particularly in Vietnam, which are, I have to say my favorites, um, I think because they have people in them. And I think you have such a facility for capturing people. The couple that come to mind are the, well, one where he obviously wasn't uh, aware that you were taking the picture was the fellow in the, was it a rickshaw? Well, they call, um, him, they, they call him a Sam Lar. Sam means three, Lar means wheeler. So it's- Yeah, that one, and there was an elderly fellow holding yeah. a child maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, those were wonderful. So I'm surprised you didn't carry on with your later travels to do more sort of street photography. Oh, well, later. like 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 I said, I have thousands of images, uh -huh. and if you want people pictures, yeah, we can. You got those we, too. We have yeah. a lot of people pictures. Yeah. Too. Okay. So I was just this, wondering. This was, this was just kind of this was a specific theme of, you know, trying of of you know the basically the alleys and passages. Oh, I see. But I do, you know, I just I love wandering through markets and mm -hmm. interacting with people and taking shots and things. So yeah, I, I have a lot more. Yeah, I, I particularly like those Vietnamese pictures. They were just mm -hmm. really very good. I think part of it is uh, maybe the black and white uh, kind of contributes to that mood a little bit for me. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, like maybe the Vietnam, and correct me if I'm wrong, is like you were there for quite a while and you got to get a sense more for the feeling of the place and of the people. And whereas in some, like in Jordan, I don't know how long you were in Jordan or in, uh, uh, in that Muktinath Mustang uh, area, you know, but I sense that you kind of just blew through there. Um. To be honest, there's lots of pictures. <laughs> so this was uh, as necessity a selection. So yeah, I, I actually I have uh, an hour and a half uh, presentation on Mustang with with history and people and and background and geology and everything. And uh, when you want me to do that, let me know. I wouldn't mind just personally seeing that to kind of see what kind of changes have happened in all those years since I've been there. Uh, more roads, I think. My, uh, my co-leader on this trip, 
uh, as someone who was based out, he was actually one of the first Peace Corps people uh, in Nepal. Um, and uh, so he spoke, uh, spoke uh, Nepali uh, and Manong and um, actually had been based up in, uh, in Mustang. Um, and, and it was kind of dodgy because the, uh, the Tibetan um, uh, soldiers who were fighting the Chinese were based in Mustang and the CIA was supporting this whole operation. And uh, so they were based up in that area and then making raids into, uh, into China or into Tibet until we pulled the plug on it. So it's, it's a fascinating area, but um, yeah, it's, you know, being in China and being Tibet, um, there's just an edge to it all the time. You, 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 you understand that you're in an occupied country when you're in Tibet and uh, going to Mustang is, is just really a delightful as Bhutan. Bhutan is very similar to somewhat more modern. I can certainly relate to the dilemma you're faced with trying to organize 10,000 photos. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I, when I, when I retired from Tektronics, uh, we had a, a rainy winter and I wasn't guiding very much. So I thought, well, maybe I should go through my slides because I'd pop them in the carousel, look at them, pull the bad ones out and stuff them in the closet. Turned out I had 14,000 slides. <laughs> um, and of those I've digitized maybe, I don't know, 3000 or something like that. So, you know, when I get around to it, uh, I still have, you know, another 7,000 slides I could go through and digitize. <laughs> I think for myself, I agree with what a couple of other people have said. I would like more focus on a particular area or a particular time period. That's what appeals to me more when I, uh -huh. uh, looking at things and I'm thinking about that in my own stuff too I think right. that it I am tempted not to focus or to have a, a broader theme but I think the focused ones are more satisfying somehow right. I would yeah. like to see a lot of more pictures of this particular place that's on your screen right now uh-huh well it's pretty it was pretty cool there was yeah. There was the three of us wandering through there and no one else there. So it was pretty special. Really interesting. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Joe? Well, Joe, thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was great, um, and we'll uh, you've whet our appetite. We I think there's interest in uh, <laughs> having you do some more uh, sifting through your files and uh, showing some more in the future. Have have some, have a lot of great shots from Antarctica as in the future as well. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Thanks okay. again. You're welcome. Um, you. And Kurt, are you ready to get queued up? Well, hopefully. <laughs> okay. I say hopefully. I crashed once already. It took me about 10 minutes to shut everything down and turn everything back on again. Uh -oh. Hopefully it works. Okay. <laughs> it just shut me off. <clears throat> Should I begin? Yeah. We. Okay. We, well, I'll be... Uh, go ahead and take the screen when you're ready. Yeah. I will. Let me just... Um, you know, I'll just hit this first screen and see if this works here. Okay. Let me um, let me introduce myself. I I uh, I joined the club. I guess I think in in 2019. I had attended a couple of meetings before that, um, and then I uh, went back to Tucson. And then there was the virus, and, and I sort of been out of pocket for a couple of years. But anyway, uh, I let me just tell you a little bit back about myself. I. We, my wife and I live in, in uh, Tucson, who we spend half a year in Portland. And, um, but I grew up, actually, we spent the last 50 years in Chicago, okay, or Chicago land. Uh, but I actually grew up in Oregon. And I grew up really, uh, my mother would say, in the sticks. 
I grew up about 20 miles uh, southwest of Portland, a place called Parrot Mountain. Um, there was nothing there. I was, uh, we, we got there when I was about one year old. Uh, and I only bring it up because the experiences there I had really, um, really are with me in my photography today. I, uh, I spent a lot of time hiking the woods in the area. Uh, there was no kids around, or very few kids. I went to a one room grade school or elementary school and uh, very few kids around. And so a lot of time was spent just hiking around. And lo and behold, I kept discovering things. I kept discovering old uh, pioneer log cabins and old uh, stone chimneys and old barns that were beaming lintel. And, and this, thing, this was really exciting for me. I, you know, to find something like that as a kid, uh, sort of, it gave me a good case of, of uh, antiquarianism, okay, which has been with me since. I love old things. Um, I used to follow tractors around in the fields in that area and look for, you know, in the spring, you plow the fields, you look for arrowheads. And uh, so this whole thing is, is uh, even though I don't have a background in this, I have a lot of interest in archaeology and a lot of interest in the history of man. Uh, anyway, quickly, I, we went to, when I was about 15, we went to Chicago. I went from a one-room elementary school to a high school of 5,000. And, um, and that changed things a little bit. And I got interested in science and art and spent a year, spent about 50 years as a psychologist actually um, in the Chicagoland area. Um, so uh, which sort of brings us to, uh, to this, my, my, my presentation is really in, in several parts. It can, it can be shut off at any time. But the first part was the, the uh, the images that are at uh, Blue Sky Gallery. And, um, and these things, these images are basically photographs of standing stones. Uh, I call it the shape of stones and the spirit of stones. And I, I take the names uh, shape of stones. Actually, I stole that from a guy named George Kubler, who was a professor of, uh, of art history at Yale back in the 60s. And he wrote this thin little book called The Shape of, the shape of Time. And he put forth some very interesting ideas about the history of art and the connectivity of art and how, how forms don't change over time. They, they get adapted, but they don't change very much. And, um, and this sort of started my thinking about photographic stones. I've been photographing stones at least since 1990. I've got about this portfolio, about 150 or so images that I've collected. And it all started before stones. It started in the 70s and 80s when I was uh, going overseas to Europe and photographing things like Stonehenge, really interested in early man and the things early man left behind. Um, and so I, Stonehenge was you know, the number one thing on the bucket list and then the stone rings in Scotland. Um, it just went to a, a lot of different places in Mexico, went to all the sites in Mexico um, and was really interested in these kind of spiritual centers. And uh, the thought occurred to me after reading Kubler's book that, that uh, you know, stone, standing stones go back a long, long way. Okay. I mean, you, you've got, you've got, uh, well, you've got the pyramids, which are actually pyramids, but you've got Stonehenge, which is actually a youngster, and you've got a place called Nabal Playa in, in, uh, in Egypt that's about 2,000 years older than Stonehenge, which is in fact a Stonehenge, okay? It's a, a standing circle. And then you've got a place in, in uh, Turkey, I think it's called Gobekli Tepe, I think it's called. And that goes back about 9,000 years. And it's a stone, it's standing stones also. And, and everywhere you look, you've got, you know, you've got uh, uh, Cleopatra's uh, needle at the Metropolitan. You've got uh, the stone that's in 2001, a space odyssey. I mean, you've got this long history of where stones somehow touch something in humans and in probably in, in hominids also. But anyway, so I started photographing stones and let's, without further ado, let's just see if I can get going here. Uh, these this series of, of images I took, as I say, over the last 20 years, um, 
And I, when I started photographing them, I didn't think of the spiritual quality about the thing, or if there was any spiritual thing about it. I was really just interested in the shapes, pure shape, uh, texture. Um, they were just, they were graphic. I like graphic kinds of things. So I was taking them for those qualities. And then the more you do it, the more you realize, you know, you wonder how they form. So it's, it's like a sculpture. It's like a natural sculpture. And something was taken away to leave these things. And so there's a whole mystery about that. And um, so that intrigued me. And then at some point, you, you know, I asked myself, then I've been studying, I've been studying homodins and early humans since for at least 30 years. And you wonder, you know, if some, a little tribe, a little group happens upon these things, what they would have thought, okay? And, um, and, and they probably would have thought there's something magical about them, okay? There's something about them. And um, which maybe we ought to copy and maybe we ought to create our own stones. I don't know. Anyway, uh, these are all from the Southwest. Um, this one has some, it has some feeling about surrealism to it, which it's another thing I like a lot. Even in high school, while I had uh, posters of uh, surrealist pictures and uh, Japanese printmakers from the 19th century on my bedroom walls instead of, uh, instead of baseball players. But anyway, this is uh, another image of just the juxtaposition of different kinds of stones in nature. Kurt, um, is there any way you can make them bigger? I don't think so. I mean, I don't know how. Any ideas? If, if you could get rid of the, uh, if, one thing you can do is just hit L twice and you, you won't get the background. It'll just. Well, that's, that's it. Don't know why it's not bigger. Anyway. Yeah, try hitting F. F. Ah, there we go. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, now, this one I was sort of interested in. I'm, the, the other issue that I like to, to pursue is, is sort of a relationship between nature and fine art. Um, in this case, this is a sort of a prime example of sort of a stone wedged between two other large stones. And I saw it and I thought, gee whiz, this is, this is levitated mass, which is a, a huge exhibit that was installed in, uh, I think it's the, uh, the LA County Muse Museum where somebody brought in a three or 400 ton stone and has it, have it, they had it sitting, they have it sitting today on, on, a, on a couple of, of walls as, a, as an art object. And this is just the same art object in nature. Um, God knows how it got there um, or how long it'll be there, but uh, it's, a, it's a favorite of mine. Kurt, now do you wait for lighting? Like I love like the shadow in like uh, between those, uh, the larger supporting rocks. Do you yes, wait for I, light or how, how, what's your strategy? Yeah, well, my strategy is, <laughs> yeah, I do. It's all natural light. You know, mostly I do black and white. I do some color, as we'll see in a minute. But mostly I'm about black and white and I'm about printing. If I can't print it, it really, it doesn't end up anywhere. Uh, I've got to be able to print it. I've always historically, um, kind of like, like Joe, I, I, I started photographing in Vietnam in, in the late 60s. Um, and it was pretty much black. I did color, I did chrome and ectochrome, uh, but basically it was black and white I was interested in. And, uh, but, I, but I wait for the light. In this case, I waited till about five, this thing faces west or sort of southwest. And I just, I waited for sunset. Now I was lucky that it was a good day, okay? Because it's out in the middle of nowhere and I wasn't going back on the next day, so. Yeah, I was lucky to get a good day and good light, but light sort of makes it, particularly for the shadows. Yeah, really nice composition. Is This is somewhere in the Southwest as well? This is in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> what format is this? 
What's that? What what film format? Uh, these were all done uh, with basically uh, a Nikon 850, you know, um, 35 millimeter equivalent. Mm. And they're all just straight. They're all just straight. I mean, I convert, I convert the, uh, the colored image in, uh, in Lightroom and then put it in Photoshop and, and dodge and burn. Mm. I should say that I, well, I didn't really get into, in, in Vietnam, as it happened, I, um, my intent was to buy a camera. When I get to Vietnam, I'm gonna get a camera. I always wanted to have a camera. And as it happened, my job required me to work uh, for 12 months. I basically worked almost every day with a photographer. And, uh, and right off the bat, he said, oh, you wanna learn photography? I'll show you how to do photography. So that this professional photographer who had a dark room out in the field in a tent and he taught me photography and um so it was uh it was, so i i did a lot of darkroom stuff but you know i i migrated to digital about 10 years ago and um it just got to be a, a hassle to try to stay with film so kurt like when like this is an amazing photograph like the way that that large vertical stone is sitting on top of the other stone. Yeah. Stone to the right, like it has an eye. It reminds me of a little bunny. It now, does, doesn't it? With little ears coming out the right. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so are you just kind of wandering around and, oh, look at the little bunny there. Yeah, yeah. I am wandering around. You know, I, 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 I think of myself as a street photographer out in the wilderness. <laughs> you know, it's, and I used to street, do street photography. You know, I'm like Joe, well, not like Joe, but like Joe sort of alluded to, when I was in Vietnam, I shot people. I mean, photography wise. I did a lot of photographs of people. When I came back to the States, I never photographed people again. And I don't have people in <laughs> my photographs. But, uh, but I wander around looking for, it's a little treasure hunt. It's kind of like back in Oregon, wandering around looking for a ruined log cabin. I sort of wander around and look for things to photograph. Now, I've got a, a number of photographic subjects that I'm interested in. So usually when I go out, I'm thinking this is going to be about rocks or this is going to be about some other topic. But it, the topic is what I'm interested in. And uh, this case, these are all about rocks. I mean, that's what I was looking for. My intention was to photograph rocks. This is in a, a weird place. Um, it's it's uh, it's the, called the Bistai Badlands. It's also in New Mexico, but it's uh, it's quite away from the other place, a ways away. Uh, the the uh, some of my stuff. I mean, when I see images, I see other artists because I've been involved with art for a long time. When I saw this, I thought of a Japanese printmaker whose name is Hosokai, okay? And uh, he did a very famous image, probably the most famous Japanese print of the 19th century called the giant wave. And I saw this, I thought, Jesus, this is the giant wave in stone. And uh, it's just a connection that I made. Now, I like the image, but quite apart from that, I like the fact that it connected with somebody else whose work I really love, and that's Hosokai. Totally. And, uh, yeah. And it's another place where you got to have the right light. There's usually never any clouds in this area. Nothing ever grows. It's all about texture and shadow. And, and uh... So, Kurt, just as an aside, what the heck is that? Is that like mud that's formed or something? It's yeah, it's probably mud, uh, some kind of calcium based stone, I think. I mean, it, it was probably buried. I mean, there was a sea on top of this that dried up a few million years ago. Um, and a lot of erosion, a lot of layers of things. It, yeah. could evolve, it could be volcanic. It could be some kind of volcanic thing like pumice. Um, but it's just on top, the bottom part um, could be basalt. I don't know. A lot of change in color. Huh. So how, how tall is that wave from the, that dark 
darker area to the top of the wave? I would say about 10 feet. Uh -huh. I shot it from a, uh, quite a ways away. Um, I, I wanted to isolate it. I probably used a 200 millimeter lens or something like that. Uh, and I had to shoot that way. Otherwise, I'd be shooting up into it because I'm in a valley uh, way below it. The whole thing is probably 40, 50 feet high. Oh, gosh. Gotcha. Okay. Um, this is in uh, Utah. Again, weirdness. You know, the earth does strange things. Okay. This is. This is all uh, sort of changes in the environment and changes in the weather and, and geographic changes and geological changes or whatever. Uh, it's, it's, uh, most of this is Navajo sandstone, uh, but some parts obviously aren't because they're there. <laughs> they haven't, they haven't uh, eroded away. Um, it's, it's like, uh, it's, for wise men or whatever, but anyway, it's um, it's it's one of those things that sort of it attracted my attention. Did you know about like you know like these four wise men or the little family here uh, before, or you were just kind of wandering around and you wandering were... around? Didn't know about any of it. I mean, in fact, I was looking for this today because it's in a place called. Uh, the Devil's, I think it's called the Devil's Kitchen. And it's an area, it could be a state park. Uh, and I'm looking, I, somebody else has to have published this somewhere. And I was looking for it today because I wanted to just nail down exactly where it was. And I, there's no sign of the signs of it. I couldn't find any signs of it anywhere. Um, in fact, what I try to do is to photograph things that haven't been photographed before, <laughs> which is hard to do these days. Um, but, uh, or at least photograph them in a different way. Uh, but I've not seen any photographs of this, but they must be photographs because, you know, people wander around there. I wasn't alone. Uh, this is back in New Mexico. Um, it's, it's sort of in this area, it, it looks like it's a naturally formed um, stone hedge. It, it's a plain. I mean, it's a grass plain. Uh, and, and there's these rocks that just come out of the ground or that were left there by glaciers or something. Um, and um, it just from a graphic standpoint, design standpoint, lighting standpoint, um, it just worked for me. Another one so, somewhere, somewhere in southern Utah. Um, Kurt, do you use uh, any kind of a filter when you take these uh, images? That dark sky. Um, is... No, I just, I just dark, I just burn it. I burn the sky in, in, uh, in Photoshop. I see. Yeah. No, it's, it it's was nice. uh, yeah. blue, I mean, blue sky, you know, so yeah. it's pretty easy to do, you just darken the blue. Right, right. right. So yeah. it's, uh, yeah, no, no filters other than just something protection for the lens. Yeah. Very Ansel Adams-esque. Yeah. Well, speaking of Ansel Adams, this is Ansel Adams' stomping ground, and he never took a picture of this. This is Eastern Sierra Nevada, uh, Owens Valley, um, Alabama Hills. Okay. Uh, and this is another. This is another levitated mass. I mean, this is a completely free stone. It's about ten feet high. I don't know what the diameter would be. It's big. It's really huge. It's a single big granite boulder, okay? And it's, it's uh, sitting on two other boulders. There's a little mountain showing between them, okay? And uh, it, th this one, 
this was one of the first ones I ever did. I ever I found this. I found this while photographing arches, okay? And this was far more interesting to me than the arches. Uh, everybody photographs the arches. But uh, I really, I really uh, in light, like the, uh, the texture and the sort of just the yeah. graphic Beautiful. design of this thing. And you got that little peekaboo. Uh, a little uh, peekaboo hill. hill in yeah. the background. Yeah. It's great. Um, actually, this is the very first one I ever took. Now, this is in this is in Kodachrome Basin, um, which is uh, sort of right right on the uh, Arizona Utah border, um, and it's this huge. I don't know how big this thing is, but it's just this gigantic finger of rock sticking up there, and uh, you happen upon it. And, and I've looked for it. I can't find it a second time. I've I've gone back there a couple of times looking for it, and I can't find it now. It's hard to miss. <laughs> but I still can't find it. Uh, it's um, it's really impressive, and I just can't imagine how somebody from twelve thousand years ago, some Clovis group wandering through the area, and they stumble on this thing, and uh, and what they would think. I mean, it took my breath away, and I'm you know modern human, um, but maybe they were just used to it. I don't know. One of the things I like like about this one and several of the others is like you've got a juxtaposition of like this gigantic monolith and then like that interesting looking mountain in the background to kind of give a us little, like a sense of environment and a little toadstool. Like that. <laughs> yeah. Is that what that, yeah, well. Yeah, the toadstool with a little rock on top of it. Top, yeah. Yeah. That in itself would have probably been a good picture by itself, but uh, you know, thanks. Yeah, that little that little feature kind of pulls you in and makes you want to walk a little further, further. and see what's there. Yeah. yeah, this is a great area to walk around if you're ever in southern Utah. It's uh, it's down there by um, it's real close to the border. Uh, you can get in it from Arizona up a dirt road, or you can get it in it from from Route 12 in uh, in Utah. Um, Somewhere between Bryce Canyon and, and the Horseshoe in, in, in Arizona. Hmm. And that's it for the 10 pictures at, uh, at Blue Sky Gallery. Um, so, uh, Pat Rowe suggested that I show some other things as <laughs> we had some time. So, I well, I don't want to bore you, but I thought, well, what I would do is. I, I do some things, but although 90% of what I do is basically black and white and black and white printing. Uh, I do some alternative printing kinds of stuff, if you call them printing, processing kinds of stuff. And I try to select some images that represent other topics, other subject matter that I, that I use a lot or that I look for a lot, but in this case done in some other kind of printing style. Um, and the, the first couple, two, three here are basically um, encaustic. Um, and I don't know if, how familiar you are with encaustic, but an encaustic is a wax. It's, it's, um, it's beeswax that basically um, is mixed with Dharma, which makes it hard. And you can either paint with it, like using oil, or you can cover things up with it. And I, in this case, I've covered things up with it. So this is a photograph of a banana leaf. Um, it's actually a series, part of a series of works I've done to, that were influenced by famous mid-century artists. In this case, it's, it's uh, Ellsworth Kelly. Um, and uh, it's, it's an image put on a uh, cradle board and uh, glued on and then waxed over and then with an iron, I've sort of put brush strokes in it, if you will. So it's a, it's a different kind of animal framed. It's uh, also framed. It's a different kind of thing, but it's basically encaustic on photograph. Here's a Grand Canyon shot, um, call it the blue hour, uh, done maybe a half hour after sunset. I don't do a lot of this kind of stuff, but I do do some when the, you know, when the light's there and you see it, you got to take a photograph of it. 
when I do color, it's usually really because of color. I, I go overboard with color, it's not usually subtle about color. Uh, I only like it if there's a lot of color. If, and, and, and this is, in this case, it's, it's also an encaustic, encaustic work over the photograph on a, a, a cradled birch board. Um, abstract, I do abstract uh, images. This one's from a junkyard. It's also, uh, so referred to it as my uh, uh, Adolf Gottlieb <laughs> abstract. Uh, he, was a, he was a pretty famous uh, abstract painter in the, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, again, it's, it's a uh, negative space. It's negative space and, and uh, ironworks on uh, photographed in the junkyard is what it is. Found objects, again, stones, sometimes small stones. In this case, it's a series of small stones uh, that have been washed up in a, in a big log on uh, Rialdo Beach in Washington. Uh, they were blue, <laughs> the stones, bluish or grayish blue. Um, and uh, so for, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> It was, it was one of the kind of things I sort of look for when I'm wandering around looking for images. I like how you put this one in a vertical perspective, assuming that was in a horizontal. It was, I took it standing up over it. Uh -huh, yeah, I it see. was on the ground and I was standing up over it and, uh, and yeah, took that nice. photograph. And this is encaustic also? It's encaustic also. Yeah, these are all encaustic. And what, what is it about encaustic that attracts you? You know, it, you, can't, you can't see it very well in photographs of the images, uh, but it, it, it's this whole texture thing on top of the image. That's really, I just find it wonderful. Um, it just gives it a whole different kind of, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of looking at any kind of thing that isn't plain, you know, it, it, that's an artwork. That's something that like, oil on canvas. You can put a photograph of it, but it's not like looking at oil on canvas in a museum. It's just different. Uh, I take photographs of spurious things, okay? This is my Jim Dine uh, photograph. I don't know if you know Jim Dine, but he's one of my favorite modern artists, uh, big on hearts. And this is a photograph of a piece of a blackboard that kids use to while away their time while mothers were shopping in a dress shop. And um, I just sort of was attracted to the design and we're talking about little kids doing this. And, uh, but it's also in caustic. Now I also do cold wax, I better move along here. Uh, we, I also do cold wax. Cold wax is another kind of thing. Cold wax, I print an image on oil paper and then modify it using various waxes where I add oil to the wax and put it on with a putty knife. Uh, this is uh, Jasper John's flag. Um, I've been looking for a Jasper John image for a long time. And this is my version of Jasper John's flag. Uh, architecture, um, that's the uh, church in uh, Taos Rancho. That's so beautiful. Some still lifes, again, uh, found pot in a uh, ruined mission in Arizona. I say found, it's not found, it was put there. Okay, somebody put it there. And uh, again, this is this is coal wax on top of photograph. With, and, with so, some tint in the wax, right, Kurt? What's that? You got some tint in the wax? Is yes, I've added oil to the wax, a, gotcha. a, a painter's oil, oil paint to the wax. And in some cases, I use a, a, a crayon, a oil crayon. So this this is a black and white photograph where you've introduced color, color. to the wax yep. medium. 
Exactly. Black and white photograph introduced color. That is beautiful. It's really spectacular. Now I also do, and I, someone did this a couple uh, times ago, and I, I forget who it was because I got in right at the end of it, but this is, this is basically uh, uh, pigment, black and white pigment on top of vellum with gold leaf underneath it. Um, it's a process that, uh, um, what's his name, Dan, um, and Burkholder. 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 Yeah. And Burkholder. Burkholder. Yeah. Developed. Uh, and some images come out very nice. And some of them I really like. Uh, this is one. This is sand dunes in, in uh, Imperial Valley, California. This is the same thing with uh, white gold underneath it. In this case, it's a cloud bank and fields in the, in the Palouse area of Washington. This one I use white gold and gold by color or by metal on a photograph of a yucca in white sands. So you got both things going on. I just colored the bottom or put, put white gold on the bottom and gold at the top and some gold in the middle. The, the vellum is obviously translucent. So you see the stuff through, through the vellum. Uh, you can use other metals. This, this one is just an example. It's, it's copper. I had this in a show in, in Tucson. Uh, called Arizona, the copper state was the theme of the show. And, and this is a, this is a, a, a bunch of, a bunch of uh, fence wiring rolled up, found on a, it looks like a sand dune. Actually, it's mine trailings, uh, tailings. And um, it, also look, it also looks like a kiwi bird, my wife says. Uh, but it's basically rolled up uh, fencing on a, on a, a sandy uh, a sandy area. Which, that you which, just found, right? What's that? that yeah, that was just thought, just in situ. Object, yeah, yeah, just came across it. Yeah, such a wonderful image. What well, it's again walking around looking for stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks to Ray. I got involved with doing some, some um, uh, platinum palladium. And so this, some of the, my subject matter, I do lots of, lots of ruins, lots of Indian ruins. This is Ute Mountain Tribal Park, which is, a, which is a, for me, it's, it's like going to Disney World, except better, okay. And uh, it, I absolutely love the place, but it's uh, basically ancient Pueblo. And uh, San Javier in Tucson. Uh, my favorite picture from a trip to Cuba. Um, it's two plastic bags drying on a clothesline. <laughs> and uh, it's it's one of those things like people were shooting all kinds of goats and stuff like that, and that was that was basically looking at the clothesline and the plastic bags. But uh, I really love this picture. I also did this with, uh, with cold wax and colored it in, which turned out pretty well also. Amazing texture you got on those bags. Uh... Yeah, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it was one of those things. You, you see, I see this stuff and I just got to photograph it. Uh, things discovered along a highway. Uh, this, is a, this is a favorite of mine. I call it close encounters. Um, I don't know what it used to be, whether it was a shopping center or an old motel or what, but it's just derelict buildings along the side of a road with a real neat lenticular cloud <laughs> above it. And uh, I did about a hundred shots uh, when I slammed on the brakes and got out of the car and, and shot for about two hours. Okay, that's it. Well, that should be my half hour. Is that right? Yeah, perfect, Kurt. Okay. Perfect. Uh, wow, those are really nice. Really some interesting uh, yeah. creative stuff there.
I would like to love to get to see those last two groups, the encaustic and the other overlay ones in person. Uh, it, it's just hard to, I mean, it's I hard can, to see them when it's a photograph. Of them. How do, can you, someone tell me how do I get out of this thing? Do I hit another button besides it, a stop share button? It should be a red button. Sure. There you ah. go. Oh, okay. I, didn't I just do did it, it for you, Kurt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the you know. stuff is, uh, you got to see it. You know, it's kind of like looking at one of Ray's uh, uh, prints. I mean, you know, you can, yeah, you can look at a photograph of the print, but to look at the print is something else or, or even yeah. a platinum print or anything or, a, you know, a, a lithograph or an etching. I mean, it just, it's, they're three-dimensional when you look at them. So, so it gives this three-dimensional quality to it. Mm -hmm. So Kurt, is, uh, is tinting the encaustic also a possibility? Can you do that? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. I, in fact, I color encaustic. You take the encaustic wax and you mix it with, with oils. I mix it with oil paint. Okay. So you can have a whole palette and you put it, I, I put it on a, uh, on a cooking pad, uh, what do you call it? a fry, a griddle, you know, like a nine by 12, nine by 13 inch griddle, sardine cans. And you put uh, encaustic wax and, uh, uh, and then you add oil, oil stick to it. And then you, you can have a, you can, you can paint a lot of people in caustic, don't use any photographs. They just paint with the caustic. The Egyptians did that. They just been painted with, you know, all their tomb, all their uh, sarcophagus were, were basically done in the caustic. And that stays transparent then? What's that? It stays transparent? Yes. Or okay. not, as the case may be. You may not want them transparent. You can use transparent oils or non-transparent oils. In your okay. encaustic, yeah. Okay. And how do you apply that to the to the image? Uh, I use a Japanese hockey brush, a Japanese uh, uh, hand tied. It's, I don't know if it's horse hair, but it's not it's not nylon because it would melt. You melt it in a melted in a, a, a cooking griddle, a, a, you know, like a fry pan. Keep it at a certain temperature. You melt it. I melt it, uh, you know, a couple pounds of wax at a time, and then use use brushes uh, to paint it on. And then you let the brush. I sort of, you know, it's a whole it's a whole process. You got to let it dry. And once it dries, then you you have to use the brush to brush everything out. And then you don't like it, so you scrape it off and you try it again. And you know, I mean, there are usually two, three, four days uh, of work to try to get the thing right. Wow. And then I realized that. If I was real careful, I could polish it, and which is like what I really liked. A lot of times, I felt I was taking a photo, a really good photograph, and ruining it, putting it under encaustic, and then I realized I could polish it. Then it brings everything out, and the polishing really helps. Hmm. And I polish it with a diaper, you know, or just a you know, a, a, what do you call it, a flour sack kind of cotton, cotton rag. Wow. So, Kurt, really nice stuff. Thank you. You said you were raised on Parrot Mountain, so you know where Six Corners is then. I'm sorry, say again? You said you were raised up on Parrot Mountain, so, so then you know where Six Corners was? I do. Also, I, I actually was at, you know, Rex Hill? Yeah. I, I, went, I went to Rex Hill Elementary School. Uh, oh, okay. I was raised in Tiger. That's why I know that. Yeah, I was, it was really Rex Hill, but Rex Hill is really the bottom part of a parent mountain. A parent and, mountain, uh, yeah. And uh, I went back there about two weeks ago for the first time in, oh, 65 years. And wow, uh, yeah. it's all it's all changed. You can't go home again. It's, Different, it, yeah. it's hot. Lo lovely it's communities. Lovely images. What's, yeah, lovely images. I really liked them. Yeah. So beautiful, Kurt. Just a Thank wonderful you. presentation as well. And it just makes me long for the days that we can all get together in person so we can actually see some see, of these things. See, see, exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Kurt, I think it also speaks to that you're not much of a drive by guy. It sounds like you find these places and stay for a while. And I, and I appreciate that part of what you're doing. You said go out, you know, I'm. Now, it, it, the, the virus has put a little stop on this, but basically I, my, my modus operandi is I go out about three or four times a year for a week at a time, is, is what I do. I don't take pictures between time. I don't carry a camera. I don't shoot my, 
I don't shoot the dog. And, you know, I don't. I don't photograph all the things. I just go out when I'm intent on on doing photography, and uh, and usually it's usually it's two, three, four, five days that I try to try to get out. Good. And if you haven't been over to Blue Sky yet, I think there's what ten more days, Kurt, for yeah, yeah. your well, like, stuff yeah. in the drawer. So. Uh, it's the stone series, just, just wonderful work. Right on. Well, thanks, Kurt. And uh, thanks again to Randy and Joe. Um, just a wonderful uh, um, set of images to view tonight. Really well done. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. And uh, I think we'll, we'll close it on out. So we'll see you again soon. All right, everybody. All right, good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.